So, Arnab, uh, tell me all about the, the journey with Chromec. What did Chromec do? It has been an incredible journey for the last 16 years, mm. uh, from the day Chromec was founded in a university lab in Durham University. Uh, we are a radiation detection technology company working in three uh, global markets, mm. uh, nuclear detection, medical imaging, and security screening. And what we provide are, uh, can be described as the next generation of radiation detectors, which are mm. color, which are digital. Very similar to what happened in the world of photography. Everything went from black and white film-based cam uh, photography to color, high-resolution digital photography. Uh, we have the enabling technology for the world of radiography to go through that journey. And the drivers are very similar to get much more information. So when we look at a digital color image, our viewing experience is really almost like reality, high, mm -hmm. high definition imaging. And that's why we like looking at very high definition imaging. Mm -hmm. The information content within that imaging is lots more than black and white uh, film-based cameras. World of radiography is going that way because we want more information out of imaging, whether it's a normal tissue, tissue versus cancerous tissues, whether it's uh, water or uh, something more dangerous, hidden as water in a bottle, or, or something benign being made to look like uh, uh, emitting radiation, uh, which could be used by a terrorist as a dirty bomb. So, mm -hmm. so having those kind of information enables customers or users to take more intelligent decisions ultimately leads on to uh, operational cost savings. And that's why we exist, and that's why our customers want to buy our product. In terms of the applications and, and markets that you're going after, cancer treatments and, and equally, or diagnosis and, and equally the, the anti-terrorism environments, how is Chromec having an impact on the market? Look, fundamentally what we do is we provide better quality of detectors uh, for x-rays and gamma rays, which ultimately uh, enables our customers to take better quality of decisions based on the information that is there in those imaging. Mm -hmm. Now, let me take an example of, of in the medical market. Uh, it is very widely known that early diagnosis of uh, diseases like cancer mm -hmm. and, and conditions, other conditions like heart disease, ultimately leads to a better patient outcome. Because if you can catch something early, you can uh, have a better patient outcome at the end of it. But more importantly, the overall cost of care comes down as well. Mm. So diagnostics uh, is a very important part of the overall healthcare system, which enables both to have, uh, you know, save lives on one hand, but also to make the healthcare much more efficient. And that's why our detectors, which does exactly that, mm -hmm. provides better quality of diagnostic mm -hmm. uh, imaging, helps in those two things. Mm -hmm. If you look at the airport security market, for example, uh, the driver is slightly more different, mm -hmm. uh, of course. Uh, airport security is all about having the most efficient way of uh, moving people and bags mm -hmm. through a airport uh, in this, in, within a safe environment. Mm -hmm. Now, Detection of explosives is, of course, important because that's ultimately what we are doing uh, in an airport. But having the ability to say reliably that there is no explosive mm. is very important because every false alarm means your and my bag when we go through an airport has to be open. Mm. Every time somebody opens a bag, that stops the process mm. of that efficient movement of people and bags, mm -hmm. and that costs money. So our detectors, again, play a very important part in providing reliability of detection. So lowering of false alarms in an airport. So again, moves people faster, moves back more efficiently in a very safe manner. Mm -hmm. and, and that reduces cost of operation by increasing operational efficiency. Mm -hmm. Very similarly, uh, in the nuclear detection space, having the ability to say whether that's a harmful radiation coming from something that can be used uh, in a harmful manner by a terrorist or, mm. or, or somebody trying to do something not naughty mm. uh, versus something which is just emitting radiation as a natural uh, phenomenon like mm. uh, concrete blocks or ceramic blocks yes. or, or, mm. or bananas in, in, in certain cases. All those makes a difference when you're handling a situation in a border where, with high traffic coming through. You don't want to stop anybody because you've got false alarms from the existing detection system. We provide detection systems which are accurate, mm -hmm. 
in detecting what is dangerous, but equally accurate in telling there is nothing dangerous. Mm -hmm. So again, increasing that confidence of taking decisions in those situations leads to better quality of operation and ultimately reducing cost. Mm -hmm. And did I read correctly online that, uh, that it isn't just you know the threats of terrorists like you know bombs being brought through the aviation terminals, but there are actually ways now of detecting you know a homegrown bomb within with your product? Sure. I mean, you know, uh, nature of threats everywhere is changing because we are dealing with uh, pretty organized, pretty sophisticated uh, uh, you know uh, people who mm. are trying to do harm. Mm. And, and so the nature of threat, the sophistication of those threats have changed over the last you know, decades. And it is a challenge uh, for industry to keep up to that, uh, together with the regulators and, and, and who specifies what needs to be there. And what we bring into the picture is, is a very advanced capability in providing very good quality of information uh, from those extra machines or handheld radiation detectors like we, we do with, with DARPA and Department of Defense in, in US or, or, or similarly in, in, in European Commission. Just to go off on a different one, Chromac, you were a startup and then obviously you've significantly expanded. What is turnover now and where are you going overall as business? Uh, we just uh, reported our results uh, last month. Uh, our, our revenues were 14.5 million pounds. Uh, since we came to the market in 2013, we have uh, reported an annualized average growth of 30% year on year. So we are we are we are a growing company. Uh, and uh, if you look at the overall opportunity within the space we operate, we are still at that very early stage of growth uh, because we have got two very big growth drivers. One is in medical imaging, which is called SPECT, uh, nuclear medicine, uh, which is a, is a huge opportunity for us at the moment because there is a generational change going on in the market led by the market leader in this space. And, and we have got a very strong offering to help uh, on an OEM basis to help the competitors of that market leader to, uh, to get into the market. And the second is in handheld radiation detectors that we developed together with the US Department of Defense with DARPA which is all about protection, very large infrastructure, even a whole city by using network detectors. And we have a real disruptive product in mm -hmm. terms of usability, form factor, uh, even, even price. So, and, and that particular market to us is worth about a billion dollars over the next decade or so. So what you're seeing today in Chromec is a steady buildup in that commercial place. In the last three financial years, uh, we have announced and secured $145 million worth of contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, those contracts are flowing through mm -hmm. as revenue. And, and we have got two really, really big growth drivers, mm -hmm. which uh, have, have, got the, have got the potential to make us a, into a really re big, successful company in this space. So 14-ish million turnover at the minute. How large could Chromac become? If you look at our end markets, these markets are big. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the macro drivers, why we are going to grow in these markets, mm -hmm. uh, those are very robust. I mean, let's take, talk about diagnostic imaging. Uh, if, if you look at uh, diagnostic imaging, there are two principal drivers. One is the emergence of the middle class population in China and India. It's a huge population that is now uh, unable to afford better lifestyle. Better lifestyle includes better healthcare. Uh, and if you look at the diagnostic imaging systems per capita in those markets compared to the Western markets, the Western more established markets, it's 5% of the Western markets. So there's a whole market that is not addressed yet and needs to be addressed where there are no incumbent solutions already. So the growth driver in that market is huge in terms of the growth potential. Similarly, in the more established market in, in the West, uh, we have had a very large underinvestment since the financial crash mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 the, in the early 2000s. And, and, and just to stand still to our service, what we are used to in the Western world 
we will have to make up that investment over the next decade or so. So the macro growth drivers within for our for diagnostic imaging, where we have a big opportunity, are very robust, and that is going to drive us uh, at for to growth. Mm-hmm. If I look at again on the nuclear part of the business, nuclear detection or the security part of the business, our borders are getting harder. Uh, something that is a reversal of trend. If you look at over the last 30, 40 years, the trend had been borders were getting open, Mm -hmm. uh, politics were becoming more liberal, Mm -hmm. uh, and people were becoming a little bit more friendly. Uh, Borders are hardening, uh, which means uh, our security concerns are hardening. The instabilities in certain parts of the world is also uh, giving rise to those concerns. and, um, And general spend in defense and security as a result of that is actually increasing, which means, again, from our handheld radiation detection product, those drivers are very strong, very well aligned to what our products are. So in the two big growth markets we've got, the macro drivers are very strong. And that's why we believe we will grow on a sustainable basis over the next decade or so. And and the opportunities are huge, both mm-hmm. billion dollar markets for us over the next 10 years. That's brilliant. You have obviously chosen to list Chromac as a listed business. Uh, was that always the intention, or did you ever consider the private equity route? It's a natural course that you take. I mean, we we were initially funded through Angel. Mm-hmm. Uh, Professor Max Robinson was the first investor uh, in the business, and and following that, we amassed quite a shareholder following in the private markets. Uh, both uh, small institutions, but also a lot of angel and individuals. And, and I think 2013 was the time when, when we thought that was the right time to get, get into the private, uh, uh, into the public markets. Mm-hmm. And the public markets have served us well mm-hmm. as a, as a business. It has served us well, uh, in terms of access to capital. Like earlier this year, we raised 21 million p- pounds worth of capital to really aid growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, we secured a, a near sixty million dollars worth of contracts from the medical market earlier this year, and 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 that you know that is fueling the growth in the business at the moment, which whereby we are expanding our capacity of the CZD part of the business by four to six folds. So there is a huge capital expansion going on in terms of capacity, and and by end of this year we will have. Uh, the state of the art uh, CZT growth facility and processing facility uh, in, in in the world. So uh, our customers feel very good about it. Uh, we have we will bring capability to this market that previously was very difficult to get. So so as a business as as, as a market uh, you know uh, for, from public market it served as well. Tell me about the organization of Chromac. Your head of office is Durham, but what about the wider functions with? I, I, I always say, you know, we are, we are a very small company operating over eight time zones. Uh, so we've got two uh, principal manufacturing uh, facilities. One in, we're sitting here. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is our headquarters. This is where the journey started. Uh, and uh, our other manufacturing uh, center is in Pittsburgh, uh, where we can build a new factory. Mm-hmm. A brand new facility, thirty thousand square feet manufacturing facility last year, uh, and and we have got two engineering offices, one in Midlands and Huddersfield in in UK, and the other in California. The California site was an acquired site. We acquired two businesses along our journey. One was in California, which made specialized electronics for our products and continues to do so. And we have got a a, a very talented group of people within that organization, which still is driving that part of the business and that capability. And in Pittsburgh, we acquired another company, which was a competitor of ours. And so we have part consolidated that CZT supply chain in the market, uh, and which we now moved into a much larger, better, uh, more uh, fit-for-purpose facility last year. Do you think uh, Chromec is right to have its headquarters where it is in Sedgefield, or do you think it would have been better having it in London or in the US or... Any other major capital city? Look, we are proud where we where we are. We we are a northeastern company, uh, and uh, our technology came out of Durham. Mm. Uh, we this is our home. Uh, but at the end of the day, our markets are global. We sell in 40, 40 different countries, and that's expanding on a on a monthly basis. Uh, yes, on one hand, we could be anywhere, mm. but at the at the end of the day, uh, the region has served us very well. Uh, we 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 have been supported very well by the 
local authorities and, and the region itself. Uh, of course, there are challenges uh, being in the Northeast. Uh, there shall, like there will be challenges being in, in, in other parts of the country. But uh, those, those are challenges that businesses have to cope with, like access to skills, uh, yeah. access to, uh, you know, connectivity and all of that. But, but I think that's getting better. Uh, and I don't think we are being held back because just because we are in the Northeast. In fact, I would say infrastructure-wise, what we have as a business, uh, I think we are at an advantage of being in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your story, Arnav. How did it actually begin for you starting Chromac here? Where did life begin for you before coming here? I grew up in India. Uh, uh, I was born uh, in a business family back in India. Uh, and uh, I. I did my first degree in India, in, in Calcutta, uh, and uh, worked in our family business for a while and then realized that's not where I wanted to spend my entire life. Uh, I came to the UK as a student because that was really one of the easiest routes to uh, come out of a family business. Uh, and, uh, and, and since then, I've worked, uh, I, I did an engineering degree in Northumbria University, went and worked for Invensys uh, in one of their North Tyneside plants. Uh, and serendipitously, I, I ended up in Durham doing a PhD. Uh, and uh, instead of becoming a banker, I came uh, and started leading the uh, company from day one. Yeah. So it has been an interesting journey how things have happened. But uh, I'm a strong believer you've got to take opportunities when, it, when, as and when it arises. And uh, even if you look at the history of Chromec, uh, of a lot of our business, uh, like nuclear business, and, and to a certain extent, the aviation security business, started off based on events. Mm. Some of them not so good events, but, but we, uh, we responded to certain uh, needs in, in markets, and that's how things started. So taking opportunities as and when arises and, and, and be positive and, and being, you know, make the best out of it is, is something that I firmly believe in doing. So you started off being very technical with your PhD. Mm -hmm. Would you describe yourself as a technical guy now, or have you moved more into the commercial world? Uh, I'm not the technical guy in the business. I was never the technical guy in the business in, uh, in, in Chromec. Uh, I do have a PhD, which, which means as a CEO, uh, I, I, I can't be fooled into believing things that are not real. Uh, so uh, in that way, I've got a, I've got a basic advantage. Uh, but Look, uh, I think having a technical background in a technical business, leading a technical business helps. But ultimately, I'm the CEO of the business. Uh, my job is making this business commercial. Uh, my job is to ensure uh, we have uh, the right shareholder return. My job is to ensure that we build a solid team to take this business and create the vision where that team is aligned and, and ex executing on that vision. So that's that's what my principal job. I've got a lot of intelligent people in the in the company led by our CTO and other uh, uh, other technical people who does the more scientific and technical job. Uh, and they are very clever people. I wouldn't want to uh, take their role or uh, do that. You've clearly been through this journey from startup through to where you are now and massive expansion. If you were doing the journey again, Arnab, what would you do differently? I think one of the key things that a lot of UK startup companies uh, face, I think, is access to capital. Uh, having access to capital, uh, quite a large amount of capital at very early stage helps uh, because it just accelerates the uh, the development cycle, which means you get to market faster and probably in a much more efficient manner. And ultimately, your capital requirement perhaps is lower if you do that. So having access to more capital at an earlier stage uh, for any startup is, is, is much, a much better model to work on. And you can see some of the U.S. startups and, and things like that, their access to capital is very different to what we have in the U.K. But that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a much more macro issue in, in the country rather than us. In the U.K., Arnav, do you think that we know how to manage innovation and the development of IP properly? Look, if you look at the overall U.K. picture, uh, we, we punch way above our weight in terms of research from our university. We, we are world-class per capita research. We are 
we are ahead of most of our mm-hmm. most of the advanced countries. But when it comes to commercializing that research, uh, we are not so good at it. Mm. Uh, we're not bad, but we could be much better. And and I think uh, the government is taking a very proactive role in in defining the targets where we need to be to be among the best in the world in converting research into products. Mm. Ultimately, innovation is about matching up uh, what is needed to what is possible, Mm. which means it is all about delivering solutions. And and research is a way to convert money into knowledge. And and innovation is about converting that knowledge back into money, Mm. uh, providing solutions, whether it's a business solution or a product solution or a services solution. Uh, so we have got a long way to go, uh, but I think it is uh, things are structurally starting to happen, uh, and and the investment needs to go, you know, go on. Uh, I remember uh, saying quite a quite a few years back uh, uh, that you know innovation is is not a T twenty cricket; it's a test cricket. It's it's a long process, and and it it is so government strategies investment strategies together with private uh, investment and how we incentivize private investment to come into this innovation space is that's the ecosystem that we need to build up and of course there's many other facets to that there's skills uh, there's there's infrastructure there is access to market there is how we do trade internationally you know it's it's a it's the whole it's a whole system that is important for creating a great innovation culture mm-hmm. and Culture is important. Every company needs to be innovative. Mm. You don't need to be technical to be innovative. And, and that is a common misnomer a lot of people has, that innovation is about invention. Innovation is not about invention. Innovation mm. can happen in, in, in services and in how we do things. Innovation, what we are doing with Jackson mm. Hogg is an innovation mm-hmm. uh, from your model. So, uh, you know. Uh, so it's it can happen at every level, and and I think businesses will need to be innovative at every level. Uh, and more innovative we are, we are going to do better as a nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if you go back to you know centuries where we, during industrial revolution, that's what drove UK to where it uh, UK uh, ultimately uh, went to uh, to be one of the global leaders, a global powerhouse. Uh, not only inventing things, but how we move those products and goods and services around the world, how we mm-hmm. trade it. So uh, I think innovation needs to be uh, part and parcel of our culture, work culture, and but we need to get better at it. Mm. Do you think there's anything that, that government can do to support CEOs to make sure that innovation actually happens? Or I think there are multiple things that governs how successful innovation can happen. Mm. I mean, a uh, very close link uh, between research and industry is one thing. Uh, having a very agile and proactive skills agenda within within the country mm. is another thing. Access to capital, how we attract uh, private capital, mm. how we incentivize in terms of tax regimes, in terms of you know, having uh, a private individual invest in something which has got a higher risk but a higher return, uh, which may take a long time uh, compared to something which is much safe uh, and and conventional uh, sort of way of doing things. These are all, you know, will play a critical part in, in, in how innovations can be successful and how CEOs can make companies grow and CEOs can take risks within that. The other thing is important as well is the risk culture. How we perceive risk uh, as a nation is is slightly different to how risks are perceived in in, in countries like America, mm-hmm. who are who are really successful mm-hmm. in their innovation. Uh, stigma attached to failure in the UK is still pretty high, mm-hmm. and and as a result, the risk appetite often is is lower than risk appetite in, for example, in California, where, you know, it's an innovation hotbed. Where... So I think there is many facets, again, many aspects to innovation where that culture needs to change. But I think it starts with a direction. It starts with a strategy. And, and I think the government's bold strategy of making the 2.4% uh, target for uh, in spending R&D 
uh, as a as a, a two point four percent of our GDP mm. as an R and D spend is a great place to start, mm. and and I think I hope that will really stimulate things. And that's probably a good thing to touch on with the risk strategy. Uh, we we do know in America you can take you know bigger risks, and yes, there's more yeah. failures. Um, but uh, everyone always wants to tell me about the good things that have happened and the successes. What about the dark times? Have there ever been dark times on this journey? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, very few people uh, who has gone through journeys like, like us will say it was just a straight line. It's never a straight line. Uh, and very seldom, I'm, I'm sure there are straight lines, but uh, most people that I have spoken to or interacted with, the, the journey is, is a tough journey. And and uh, and I think it is. You start off with a vision, uh, and then you have to take a lot of people along with you around uh, along that vision. And 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 there are many aspects to that is which is very difficult. You know, you 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 have to raise money when you don't have a particularly anything to show. Uh, you have to bring those shareholders with you and understand and make them understand what you're trying to do. Uh, you've got, you know, you're trying to do business internationally, uh, different cultures, different challenges in each of those markets. Uh, you're trying to do business with very large organizations, very large government entities when you are a very small, tiny company mm -hmm. to start off with. And, and that all brings its challenges. And, and then you're trying to build a team based on a vision. And, and, and these, I, I, think, I think resilience uh, is, is one of the things that is very important uh, as a quality of being a leader of a business like ours yeah. and, 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 and any business really. So yes, it's not a straight line. And you've obviously built the team from quite a small team in the early days to now obviously as it expands. What are you looking for for new employees that are coming for the journey? Look, I mean... As, as you rightly pointed out, I mean, I was the first employee and the only employee mm -hmm. for a period of time uh, in this business. And, and at different stages of the business, you need different skill sets and different type of people. Um, and, and not all, everybody is suited for that entire, uh, entire journey. Now, what we're looking for now is uh, this, this is a time when, when, when the company is growing. This is a time when all that hard work that went into research, development, validation, proving out, getting early customers, making, convincing somebody with an idea to adopt something. We are just about past that stage. We are now, we are now into products. We have got customer base. We are selling in 40 countries. We, it's all about expansion exec, and, and execution is a big part of that. It's, it's, it's the most interesting, if for some people, this is the most interesting part mm -hmm. of it because this is where you, you, you are seeing traction in the market, you're seeing growth, you're seeing expansion, you're, and, and all the challenges that come with it. So people with, you know, uh, with an ability to sustain a very fast-moving environment, often fast-moving and changing environment, so be adaptable, uh, but really excited about you know, the, the uh, fast uh, and helter-skelter almost uh, ride through, through this journey uh, is, is, is something that we look for in people, really people who are excited about, you know, the, the trajectory of growth, people who are excited about not having just a sheltered, structured environment, you know, where, where a nine to five really works, but some, some, some people who are excited about what we do, because ultimately what we do is save lives or make people's lives safer. So there is a bigger vision to attach to Chromex, but at the same time, the big growth curve that we are going through comes with its own excitement and challenges. How would you describe the culture within Chromec? Driven. Driven. Mm. And equally, when you're recruiting in America and in the UK, do you have different challenges finding those driven people in different parts of the world? Of course, uh, we do. Uh, you know, uh, work culture in America and UK are very different. Work culture between different age groups is very different. Uh, and and uh, so it's it's about finding the right people and the right match. And that's that's always that's always the case. Uh, you know, may, the best skilled person in in a particular category may not be the fittest person for Chrome, and and we just have to accept that, and and vice versa. So it is about finding the right person for the right job. Ultimately, what I personally look for. Uh, in a team member are are the soft skills uh, are 
other skills as how you operate as a person. Because if you're if you're recruiting an electronics engineer, uh, you'd expect them to know the electronics. But mm -hmm. it is about how you interact as a, within a team, how you interact in a customer environment, mm -hmm. how you fit into the culture in that driven culture. So those are as important as the core skill set. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And thinking about skills and the whole kind of skills agenda, which obviously ties into your business, do you think we're doing enough to get the right STEM students coming through to come into companies like yours at Chromex? Look, overall trend is better in the UK at the moment. Uh, one of the things that uh, culturally, again, the big difference between US and UK, because those are the two markets we operate in as an employer, uh, technology is technology professionals are more valued in the US than compared to the UK. Uh, we and and I think there is a there is a whole role from learned societies to uh, you know to to the to the government probably and and industry itself to value our professionals in technology more um, to have more active role models within this uh, so that a young person not not when you're sixteen but when you're eight. You're excited about science, you're excited about maths, you're excited about physics, because everything that goes around you is governed by those rules. Uh, so you either win or lose people very, at very early stages. And, and I think we all have a duty to really be those ambassadors and be those people who ultimately inspires uh, young people in schools and, and to continue that journey into the STEM. Workplace is changing. And, and the jobs are changing because technology is moving at such a fast pace. Uh, and, and I think skills, upskilling and, and, and keeping people skilled to do the job in 10 years' time is going to be a challenge that we'll face worldwide. How we cope with it is going to be interesting to see. Thinking about UK industry as a whole, should we be optimistic over the next five years? Look, we are going to we're going through an interesting change, uh, you know, period at the moment. Uh, we have seen the effect in currency. There's got positives and negatives. Uh, we, uh, you know, whatever is happening in politics is beyond industry. Uh, uh, generally, industry can cope with most things as long as it can plan. Mm. Uh, so I think the more certainty we have as industry in the overall direction of travel, uh, the better it would be. But we have a resilient uh, set of industries within the UK, and I think the future is bright, and, and our brand is still very strong uh, as, as a UK you know, made product. So, uh, so I think the future is optimistic. And when you're not leading Chromec, do you manage to find time to switch off? What do you do with your spare time? <laughs> I, I, I do quite a few other things. Uh, I, uh, I chair the Regional Academic Health Science Network, which is uh, which is a NHS England body, at, uh, you know, sort of regional body, which is not East and North Cumbria, but nationally, uh, looks at innovation in and out of NHS. So uh, I've chaired that for the last uh, five years. Um, uh, it's going through an interesting journey, and and I think it's it's a very you know exciting space, the health space itself. So. I do that. Um, I, I also sit on the Innovate UK Council, um, uh, which is a main innovation agency for the UK government. Um, but I, am, I also chair the local cricket club in, in Durham City, mm -hmm. which is uh, cricket is one of my passions, and, mm -hmm. and I think it's a it's a great sport. So spending time with the family as well is, is an important part of my you know, relaxation. I think it's so important to get the balance of work and family life and the wider interests. Absolutely. Um, Arnab, it's been a delight to meet you and uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very thank much. You. Pleasure. Cheers.